Welcome back to WEMcast with me, Owen Walker. In this session today, we are with Stian Mawson talking about the basics of critical care. Stian uh, is a retrieval practitioner working in Scotland with a particular clinical interest in pre-hospital emergency and critical care. He's also interested in major and complex trauma, resuscitation, pediatrics, and human factors. He's also a part-time lecturer at Stirling University on the Paramedic Science degree program. In addition to pre-hospital care, Stian's interest also uh, includes his involvement in international emergency aid and disaster response. He's also an avid traveller and a scuba diver. So welcome to WAMCAST, Stian. Thank you, Owen. Thank you for a very comprehensive introduction. I appreciate it. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Stian, so what we wanted to do today, I know we, we've had a bit of discourse outside of the podcast, is around sort of tackling the fundamentals of, of critical care, some of the basic foundational principles. So just, just sort of opening up, why, is, why are the basic fundamental principles so important? Um, yeah, why, why is it important? It's, it's the root of everything we do, I think. Uh, and the fundamentals, as, at least by my experience, and I'm sure you have some experience as well, Owen, is, is ultimately what's going to bail you out of a very sticky situation. Um, it's, it's immediate and requires less technique and less equipment. And by that, I, doesn't, I don't mean that you don't need to know what you're doing, because you definitely do, but you don't need all the extra kind of faff. So if you consider the RSI, you know, you consider that where it's a jaw thrust. The jaw thrust is immediate, can, can give you tactile and sensory feedback right away. And often, often the jaw thrust is, is sufficient, isn't it, to keep an airway open, to, to reach our means immediately. An RSI would take forever in terms of, in terms of that, that time it takes to set up, get the equipment ready, get the drugs ready. Um, but it might not be more successful. If anything, the RSI can make it harder for you, can make it more difficult because it is more of an advanced technique. And there are definitely more people in the world trained in doing a jaw thrust than doing an RSI. So ultimately, I think the benefit of a jaw thrust or the basics, if we refer to that, uh, is immediate and is all encompassing. It's uh, omnipotent and, and everywhere, if you like. Um, and if, you, if a jaw thrust doesn't work, that kind of immediately gives you more access to other options. You know, you, can, you still have the OPA, you still have the NPA, you still have a two-handed technique, repositioning, IGELs or the RSI, at least now in the UK scope of things where, where you have this list of items in your, in your pocket. Um, and that's probably also why the JR Calc does recommend the stepwise approach. So you have these tools available to you after the, after the basics is done. Um, rather than focusing in on the advanced technique that might not work and then you get stuck. And, you know, there are historically many examples and particularly, you know, the Elaine Bromley case that we all come to know and maybe not low, love um, that, that kind of uh, fed into the human factors approach in medicine quite a lot from aviation. Um, but ultimately, I think the basics are important, like I said, because they're a cornerstone. They're easy to deploy quickly, but also to fall back on. Um, and particularly banging on airway management, you know, it's, it's, it's shown time and time again for the paramedic profession, the pre-hospital profession, that we aren't really good at managing airways well. I mean, that's a lot of the reason why the, the basic scheme and the doctors in pre-hospital scheme in England and the UK came about is because people were coming into the then not trauma centers with poorly protected airways. And the response to that was, well, we can send some doctors out to do some RSIs for this. But ultimately, like we just discussed, RSI is not the root of all good. It could also be root of evil. Uh, and so falling back on the basics, I think, is important. And it applies to hemorrhage control, stopping that bleeding, or even just reducing pain. Uh, and that is for a technician, student paramedic, paramedic, or a critical care paramedic, or, or a doctor, it doesn't matter who it is, always start at the basics and do a stepwise approach, build yourself up. Ultimately, what the patient might need is an RSI, but is that going to be right now with you? What's immediate and what works, eh? So listen, let's loop, loop back because I think that's fantastic and you've said a lot in there actually, Stian. So let's loop back to, <laughs> wait, no, it's good. It's great actually. And um, um, where you are now. So you're a Norwegian paramedic, come over to the UK, currently in Scotland, um, doing a full-time role um, in Scotland, but also working part-time in Stirling University uh, as, as a lecturer. So everything you've just said right, right, right now, it kind of really applies not only to the critical care role you're doing, but how does that transfer through to some of the some of the teaching and sort of mentorship you do really at Stirling University? How does that trickle down? What's the trickle down effect there? 
Can you elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just, just uh, it, w- it would be more so around maybe just w- w- teaching the. Uh, I suppose what I'm getting at there is how how are you how are you teaching the fundamentals of pre-sport care maybe and or fundamental the, the the fundamentals of critical care to to the student groups so that they are they can do the jaw thrust well or that they do do the fundamentals well so when there is a, an, a, a top layer of critical care that they're already optimizing the patients um or, or yeah or familiar with with those robust techniques from a from a from a student perspective because it, it kind of starts at that level doesn't it and then and then once they they're talking well as a foundation it's a great platform to 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 build on but i i that, that won't feature in the podcast that bit but yeah, if you go in, yeah yeah if you go in like just give it yeah. two give it a couple of seconds and then go uh okay yeah so uh, i think um I, I kind of fell into education uh which is which is uh, interesting that because I haven't got a university approach, I guess, to to my teaching and how I bring that across. Uh, I very personally uh, go into education and everything I do with 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 parts of myself, if you'd like. So I always look at or, or consider what I wanted, and it was always my want and and kind of an achievement for me to start working in critical care. So everything I've done has been working towards that, and ultimately as pre-hospital care is developed. Critical care is a tier that is there and it is the ultimate tier pre-hospitally at the moment. So I was going kind of thinking that's the level, that's the end point. You know, that's what any student that comes into university could be a critical care paramedic. They could also go off and do medicine and other things, but, but in the pre-hospital realm, they could become critical care paramedics or advanced practitioners one day. And, and so it's already all about fostering that approach from the day they come in the door, you know, um, not just focusing on the JR calc. It's super important. It's absolutely the guidelines that any paramedic need to be aware of and should follow. There's so much more to paramedicine today than just reading the recipe. Uh, you know, paramedics today are part of making that recipe as well. And ultimately, any student that comes in through that door could become a a re- research paramedic, could become a, a, a consultant paramedic, um, and so on. And so you need to start fostering these things early. And then, of course, teaching the basics well, it shouldn't just be, there shouldn't be an, an ambulance jaw thrust and a hems jaw thrust, if you'd like. The jaw thrust the jaw, is the jaw thrust, and it should be solid. It should be, like I said, immediate, and it should be accurate in every patient. And so you need to teach it for uh, adults, for children, uh, for trauma, for medicine, uh, and for all the situations that are, you know, where it's relatively easy, but all the situations where it can go wrong. And I think, um, that trickles back into my own practice, I guess, because it is important to me. It's high on my list to get it right, and I kind of keep it current um, in university, teaching it away. But likewise, I also get the experience pre-hospital and actually doing these things because a lot of the patients I do see, um, not that I see a lot of patients because that's critical care for you, but the p- patients I do see generally are unwell enough to require a jaw thrust, or many of them are. And so I can actually take that back into uni and say, you know, listen, this is how it actually probably will work. And I think that's quite important as well to, to my practice is that I can, I can take it back and say, look, I've done this more than once or twice. This is going to work for you. And this is probably not. So Stian, the old adage really is around the, the trauma patient is all about mechanism of injury um, uh, with a robust patient assessment and the medical patient is all about the extensive medical history with a robust patient assessment so almost the meeting point is the patient assessment but mechanism of injury for the trauma patients and past medical history for the for the medical patients in your mind um, what are some of the fundamentals of patient assessments that that, that that meet around the basics of critical care that that, that everyone should really try and adhere to well, I, I, you know, you, you mentioned your old adage of, of history taking, and I, you know, it very much resonates with me still. Uh, if you listen to your patient, they will tell you what's wrong with them. You know, that's the adage. And, and I, I'm a big fan of that. And so getting a good patient rapport and elicit, eliciting that information directly from the source is going to give you way much more information than, than palpating a pulse or squeezing a tummy or listening to a bystander. And I think we all <clears throat> have been in the situation where you ask the patient a question and someone else chips in with the answer and you're kind of thinking, you know, I'm, I'm asking the question because I want to know the answer, but also because I'm assessing my patient's uh, conscious level and their coherency and, you know, you're getting more. And so I, I've already 
just kind of added there that just asking the question isn't enough. It, it is also what you perceive and what else you sense. So I, I think very much still that examination, the important bits do not lie in the technical, uh, in the prescriptive, checking that, checking this. It's using your, your whole senses um, and, and your surroundings, you know. So in the medical patient, is this house tidy or untidy? Is the sofa or chair that the patient is sitting in suddenly been turned into a bed over a number of days? Are they mobilizing? Are they getting stuff done? Have the dishes been done? You know, all these subtle things that can tell you something's not quite adding up to this patient who tells me they're generally well. And the same for me- mechanism of injury. <clears throat> Look, look at look at the vehicle critically. You know, it, it, for example, in an RTC, you know, um, uh, has the has the, has the front wheel moved anywhere? Has the has the cabin been intruded? Has the windscreen even been cracked? And if not, you you know probably not looking at a major injury here. But if those things are are present, or the or the or the wheel, the steering wheel is suddenly been pushed far back into the vehicle, you're looking at someone who could be sick. Have they used restraints? We have to kind of go out of your way. And then when it comes down to the nitty gritty of it, I say the most important thing in your assessment is to be courageous and resilient enough to, to just check properly and take that time to not rush through it and take your focus off the other bits. It's so easy, just like we, when we lead a team, we say it's easy to get drawn into the clinical stuff. But when you're alone in a situation like that and you don't have your full team yet, it's easy to do the opposite and to want to start and task manage, but forget to actually check fully what's going on here. You know, I, I imagine myself in many situations, a paramedic and ECA crew where your patient is so well, you need to start doing things immediately, but you can't do things immediately and check well. Uh, and so, and sometimes that's right. You just need to crack out and a simple ABC and start correcting what really needs to be corrected, but they need to stop at some point and say, I need to go back and recheck and do it properly particularly, you know, chest injuries is a bugbear of anyone. I think there's enough evidence out there to say that not just paramedics, but any clinician is not really good enough at detecting chest pathology, even if we check really well. But, you know, the first thing we can do is to check that really well and then focus on the chest, check each side, check each rib, clavicles, listen well um, across the whole chest um, before you can really exclude. And I know, I know someone will be listening now and, and, and yell at the screen for me saying, listen well, instead of pulling out the ultrasound. But I'm just considering who's listening in. I think, you know, the stethoscope is still very much our kind of cornerstone of practice. And ultimately, if you can do ultrasound, I think, you know, it's been, in a couple of years time, that's going to be, that's going to be the suggestion is pull out the ultrasound and have a look at what's happening in the chest. But if you don't do this, you might miss the simple things, you know, like, like subcutaneous, subtle subcutaneous emphysema, um, which can be present even if you can't really hear anything on the chest, or or a flail chest, as we, we kind of know, can manifest quite lately. And you, you might feel it way before you see it. I'll probably argue you will feel it way before you see it, but then you have to actually go and, and feel for it. And that means not just pressing a little bit on the chest, you need to actually hold it for a cycle of breath. You need to feel if there's any paradoxical movement. And if you're in doubt, don't brush over it, kind of focus in and and and, and assure yourself that this is not a flail or, or, or identify that for sure it is. And another bugbear, or not bugbear, but another important thing I think to to getting the uh, examination well is remember exposure. So, not just um, uh, not just unwrapping your patient. That's important to look again. Use all your senses. If you're going to be able to perceive, you can't do anything through clothes. It doesn't really work that well. And for sure, all my examinations through clothes, I always go away from feeling I'm missing something. You know, just that like, little voice in the back of your head saying, "This." You know, there's, there's more to this, but I don't know what yet. Because sometimes you can't undress the patient. And that brings me to kind of the, the other side of that sword, the other edge, is make sure you cover the patient back up again. And I see that time and time again. Patients, unfortunately, uh, being slightly forgotten about. And if I can just mention it, hypothermia is really important. I mean, even, even in summer, you know, normal body temperature is 37 degrees. Take plus minus, depends on the book you read. When has it ever been 37 degrees outside in the UK? And unless there is 37 and a half degrees and the ground you're lying on is 37 and a half degrees, you will lose body temperature. But we so easily forget that. Um, coming from Norway, maybe I have a different appreciation of it, but living in Scotland, for sure, it gets cold enough air as well. Stian, let's just for a second drill down into some of the details. 
because you know critical care really is around the details d- done well. So looking at some of the aspects of airway management, so how can we optimize some of these maneuvers and or adjuncts within the airway to, to really, yeah, to really optimize and maybe even mitigate and offset some of the more advanced procedures? Uh, yeah, so yeah, how, how is the airway done well? Uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm not an expert here, but my, my opinion, I guess, is uh, uh, something that's easily forgotten, even if it's drilled down, especially, in, you know, knowing from university, drill down in practice, just consider blockage. I think the first skill to go amongst any of us is remembering to check in the airway, actually looking in the airway. Uh, and it's, it's because we just want to open that airway. Like I said, the jaw thrust is immediate. Just open the airway and get some air in and out. But what if that doesn't work? You need to consider that there's a blockage that even if you start BVMing the patient, putting an OPA in, putting an eye gel, there might be something there that, that makes you unable to manage the airway altogether. So consider a blockage. Uh, something might have, uh, might have gotten into the airway. Um, when you actually start using your hands doing stuff rather than your eyes, the very most basic thing uh, that I learned awkwardly really just got focused on when I started doing critical care was the positioning and getting that head into a nice neutral position. It's kind of banged on about through education, but no one really, you know, I thought it was something that was, that was for the RSI only. You know, you really need that just to get your view. But ultimately, it's about the position of the airway and the openness and the patency of that tract is so much better with a head in a neutral position. And so I think any patient, medical or trauma, because it is a neutral position, is equally safe in trauma, uh, make sure the patient has a head in a neutral position as an, as an early, early thing you do. And if you do that when you get to the patient's side, uh, doing the jaw thrust, but it turns out this patient's going to need an eye gel and suddenly they'd be great and need an RSI and a critical care team turns up, because of all the concurrent activity that happens usually later on, the more issues you find, this is your kind of golden opportunity. You only ha- had to worry about catastrophic hemorrhage. Now you're looking into the airway, get a pillow or a blanket under that head and lift it up. And then that, that task is offloaded. Later on then, when, when the critical care team turns up and handovers are being done and no one is focusing on that airway really anymore other than getting a tube into it, then we know it's in a in an optimal position. We don't forget that bit. Um, and, and for those who are not familiar with that, sniffing the morning air position, it's, it's all about getting the, the outer air in line with the top of the sternum or the manubrium, if you like. So you can draw like a horizontal line in the supine patient from the, the tragus of the air down to the manubrium and the patient is facing straight up in the air, then you've done something well. And that means you need to try and avoid, of course, like flexing and, and extending the neck. That's not really part of airway management. So patient looking straight up in the air, slightly lifted from the ground to where the air is in line with the manubrium. I think it's so important, so key. And it's one of the first things I will do is just look for something to get under the head. Now in children, of course, very small children, we need, we need to remember that anatomically their head is slightly larger than their body. And so you need to build up under their shoulders probably rather than building up under their head. But it's all about, you know, neutral position. Can they look straight up in the air? Then, then you're kind of there. And for the very obese, uh, in the pre-hospital world, it can be very difficult to manage because they will need a lot of what we call ramping. So you might have to build up quite a lot under their shoulders and upper end to achieve that trach is in line with the manubrium. And they will probably be more seated in an upright position doing that, doing that with a bit of extension just from how they're built. Um, and that can be very, very difficult. But again, it's super important to being able to get a proper seal and, and air in and out of that patient group. And, you know, we should, we, we should offer them the same level of care as anyone else. Um, so definitely early on in kind of the difficult airway patient group, take some time to get the basic assessment and basic interventions right because it makes it better later on. So fantastic, Dean. So looking now maybe closely at breathing, what are some of the fundamentals that, that clinicians can do to optimize uh, both the breathing assessment or, and or even some uh, basic adjuncts such as non-rebreather masks, uh, SpO2, ETCO2, some of these kind of fundamentals? Yeah, so uh, I don't know what you think, Owen, but I think uh, the first thing is to remember putting it on. Uh, so getting oxygen on your patient uh, is often forgotten, I think, um, in the heat of the moment. Such a simple thing to do, but also one of the things you just... Either because I think uh, through practice, someone else has always done it. Uh, or it's one of these things that, you know, the oxygen cylinder is a little bit tucked away in his own bag. Or 
um, is often forgotten. So just remembering oxygen. And I think most places now will teach, just get oxygen on on the airway if you're dealing with someone who's horribly unwell, because um, you can always take the oxygen off later. And I, you know, I'm not against that practice. Um, when is it bad to give oxygen? Really? You know, yeah, for a prolonged time in your COPD or emphysema patients, but in the immediate critical care aspect of things, uh, you, you can do very little harm with oxygen. Uh, you know, there's some types of, to- types of toxicity where you might want to be careful with it, but it's so, so rare. I don't think it's really something we need to go into depth about. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'd like to say um, you're making sure you have enough flow to the mask when you remember getting it on. Not all services carry the good old Hudson Reservoir mask anymore. But um, but if you're using a BVM as an example, make sure you fill the reservoir. So you need a high enough flow of that oxygen um, to go into your mask or BVM. And uh, And just remembering your basic maneuvers again, just remember that if you're going to be, use a BVM and support breathing, um, remember that it's always easier to support slow breathing in a patient with reduced level of consciousness than over overdrive breathing, if you'd like. Um, you know, it's easily we teach in uni if it's less than 10 or above 30, consider supporting ventilation. But arguably, uh, you know, I can count on one hand the amount of people who's been hyperventilating or, or breathing too fast, at least, where I've been pulling out the BVM because it's just so difficult to sink. And when you're not sinking, suddenly you're just squeezing a lot of air into the patient's tummy or abdomen and stomach, I mean, and then you know, you're just causing issues for yourself, but in a slow rate, you need to consider it. Um, or in the patient who's not breathing for themselves at all. And then I think just the pearls and pitfalls would be, because uh, it's so easily forgotten, is remember that you're not trying to push the mask onto the patient's face. You're lifting the patient's face into the mask, or at least the lower jaw. And it's just kind of resting on the nose, isn't it, on the, on the maxilla, and pull the jaw up. And it's so difficult. I think even now, even if I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with using a BVM, I think even now it's, it's very much, uh, you know, it's something I think about. I stop and kind of remind myself every time, just just remember to get this thing right because that's what's going to get in your way, isn't it? That's what's going to make you think you can't get a clear airway when all you're doing is obstructing it for yourself by poor technique. Uh, and suddenly you're now, you know, chucking an eye gel or a tube into someone who didn't really need that. Um, uh, and, and, and on that note as well, being careful with your fingers, you know, you're supposed to, do a good, nice grip with your fingers around the jaw, but you could, you could, and particularly in children, you can squeeze off the airway if you put too much pressure on, on like the mentum uh, below the voice box and the, and the, and the chin. And, and those are kind of the two, two pros and pitfalls I'd say. Remember to lift, you know, you can go on about, hang on about the C grip. We all, we all have tried to hold it and we'll probably do that. And ultimately asking for help, you know, is, is, is not bad. Get a two hand technique on early. If you, if you think that what you're doing is not working, Get a two-hand technique on. Get you, you get your partner to come and hold the mask uh, with one hand with you, or, or, or they do a they do a good old um, two-hand technique while you can squeeze them air in and out. Um, and another tip, I guess, is you know if, if if they got a beard, you can always use some lube in the beard to get a good seal. I think that's that's some, that's that's a trick that's not disseminated widely. Uh, but you know the, the people with beards can be ventilated. It is definitely going to be troublesome with the pressures you generate, but but you, you can use a bit of lube in the beard to get, get that seal. Any, any tips you know about, Owen? Um, absolutely, yes. So everything you've really just said there really uh, resonates with me. Also, uh, Stiana, as you mentioned, you know, trying to harvest as much information from the patient as possible. So pay t- paying attention to the SPO2 monitor on the finger, make sure it is on the nail bed. M- mindful that if the nail beds are cold, that it's not, might, it might not be accurate uh, as, as a reading. Uh, try and, um, I'm a massive advocate of uh, ETCO2, vent- self-ventilated ETCO2, so, so the nasal prongs, um, as a surrogate of, of cardiac output. Um, and you, and, and it's, it's about trying to you know, harvest as much information as possible in f- for the breathing assessment. Look at trends. Um, for the breathing assessment myself, get, get the hands around the back of the chest because a lot of people miss posterior rib fractures. So really start to, to try, start to feel uh, the, the, and innovate around the chest and around the ribs. Um, it's not foolproof. Though it's, it's not entirely sensitive. Um, just because you can't feel a fracture doesn't mean one hasn't occurred. But if you can, then 
Um, even, uh, even to try and sense pain and get that feedback from the patient, as you said, um, but trying to, trying to cleave as much pa- information from the patient as possible, whilst, like you said, treating the patient. And, and from a respiratory re- uh, assessment, res- the respiratory rate is pretty much the most physiologically sensitive sign. And so someone with a consistently high or above average respiratory rate, in my mind, is probably the biggest warning sign outside of any other physiological marker around blood pressure, pulse, SPO2 or CO2. It's, it, uh, and, and that is, is, is probably the biggest red flag in, in, in my mind. Excellent. I completely agree with you. And you, you kind of stole the words out of my mouth there, which is, which is great. Um, the respirate, yeah, it's, it's the most sensitive sign of any critical illness. It doesn't have to be related to just the thorax. But, you know, it could be the shocked patient or the patient in DKA because it, it's, the, it's the immediate comp- compensator for, for acidosis, isn't it? So you can immediately think the patient's got high respirate, something horrible is going on. It could just be anxiety, but I would be extremely careful to putting it down to that, especially in the kind of realm of critical care. Uh, and that kind of brings in quickly, um, you know, what was ta- taught to me or told to me, I guess, when I joined critical care is, you know, you, uh, which, which is absolutely true, unfortunately, is that you've now been a paramedic on the road and you've been seeing patients with low acuity and very few patients with high acuity. And you're used to thinking, that the patient needs to kind of declare themselves and prove to you that they're well enough for your attention. As cruel as it sounds, that is kind of the primer you do have. You come into every living room thinking, you know, Ugh, what GP am I going to refer you to today? Because you're probably not going to be unwell. And unfortunately, that's, that just becomes an ingrained part of your decision-making, a bias, if you'd like. And you join critical care and that just swaps. And every patient is trying to die until proven otherwise. You know, and you need to just assume that this patient has got some horrible illness unless I can you know, through my thorough examination, exclude that, uh, which is interesting. I really like what you mentioned about Entidal um, as well. Completely agree. Um, and something I've forgotten to mention, which is, which, is, which is great you bring up. Really big fan of it. Even, even in, in BBMing someone without it being attached to an eye gel, not necessarily be, as a surrogate of, of circulation because it's not really good enough for that, but just as a confirmation that air is passing in and out. And I want to mention this because I find in university, when we do OSCEs and teaching and training with students, they have a generally good theoretical grasp of what the entitled do. But as soon as they start doing an airway assessment or airway stuff, they look to the SATS probe or the SATS for feedback. And like you say, you know, uh, the capillary bed can be cold or there could be other things that causes the SATS to be unreliable. It also needs generally in a, in a, in a, in a good platysmogram, you need eight seconds of a quality you know, beat by beat uh, assessment to get a, a SAT. So it's already eight seconds delayed if it's reliable. Uh, and it doesn't really give you a measure of having an airway immediately. Now, yeah, of course, you can use your eyes and look for chest rise and fall, and you can listen and you can look for misting and all these things. But in a high stress situation, a high noise situation, a lot of people on the scene movement, your entitled can be that immediate confirmation that you still have an airway or you managed to achieve an airway, intubated or not. It is a, is a measure of, like you say, circulation, but also that a parcel of air has moved from the environment into the patient and from the patient back into the environment. So, yeah, I just want to reaffirm that 100%. If any students are listening, use the entitle as a measure for an airway, not your stats. <laughs> Fantastic, Stian. So just looking at circulation for, for, for a minute, um, just in, in, encompassing circulation. So everything that encompasses a circulatory, both assessment and maybe arresting hemorrhage or addressing the circulatory problems. What do you see maybe not, not done so well or indeed that we can optimize every time? Um, very much from a, like say, from a critical care perspective, but can be done on the ground um, by every paramedic. Yeah, basic critical care, isn't it? Um, well, from a basic critical care point of view, I think we all forget the, the capillary refill quite easily. Uh, to be honest with you, I think that's the one I've seen that is most overlooked just based on experience. Again, this is completely kind of empirical, but not based on any, any randomized control trial on this. But I think the capillary refill time is, is often missed. Uh, it's easy, easy and quick to kind of go for the pulse. Um, that, that's fine if you know what you're looking for, I guess, but then it's, it's about assessing the pulse. And I have a, a brilliant example from the other day where, so this was a retrieval, so it's slightly outside of the pre-hospital environment, but it's still a patient we haven't met, uh, a patient we're completely starting the reassessment of. The only difference is they had monitoring on already, so we kind of knew 
what their numbers were. Uh, and I'm using this example then to, to kind of say, to tell that don't always trust the monitoring. So this patient was, was on pressors, great blood pressure, stunning blood pressure, you know, one, 130 over 80, brilliant. Um, and it was noted they had a somewhat weak pulse, but it was present and kind of discarded. Um, now, as soon as this patient was taken off the pressors, their blood pressure crashed horribly um, and pressors were started. It didn't really do much for the patient until we started giving boluses of fluids. Very easy to just demonstrate that, you know, the filling of the patient was probably not the best. Uh, smashing blood pressure, but pressure doesn't equal flow. And that's when you need to start, even if you see that good number, trust your senses a bit and don't just feel for, is there a pulse there or is it fast or slow? Is it full? Is it weak? And that really becomes important, but it's so easily overlooked. And now this was an assessment made by a really experienced and definitely a, a, a consultant in emergency care that I have a lot of respect for um, and who, who is excellent. But it's so easy to get fooled by the numbers and other things. So you really need to trust that, that circulation assessment. It's, it's, it's also an old adage, isn't it? But patients are going to declare themselves through skin changes and, and pulse way before their numbers are going to start changing. Uh, and so look at the skin, capillary refill time, good feel of the poles. I think that's already done most of it. And then you go looking for trauma as well, of course, you know, uh, in the trauma patient. Um, and adding to that, then you mentioned doing a really thorough kind of bit by bit circumferential chest examination. And into that comes, you know, don't forget the back of the patient. The, the back has a spine going through it, but it's also part of the chest and it's part of the abdomen. You know, the thoracic and lumbar aspect represent parts of internal organs as well. So especially in the assault victim or someone who's got a penetrating injury, don't forget looking at the back. Um, you could do that on B, you could do that on C. But what I would say is if you haven't done it by now, by the end of C, what's your reason for that? I think, you know, uh, again, again, acting on suspicion, someone who's been involved in an RTC, probably not necessarily to go straight for that. But in someone who's been assaulted or had to fall or any other way they can have been thrown about, you need to start looking for that injury at the back as well. And a lot of bruising um, that could be in, involved in internal bleeding can be found at the back. So you just need to remember looking at the, the patient as a whole, not just what fa is facing you at the time. So Stian, looking at monitoring for, for, for a minute, what are some of the other essentials of monitoring that we maybe haven't spoken about already um, that you'd like to see when you turn up uh, as part of the sort of critical care team? Okay, so yeah, um, from my experience anyway, what we, what we like to have is, uh, is get it all on. Um, and I've got different experiences and I'm, I may be rustling some feathers doing this, but when it comes to monitoring the heart rate, so we typically, from a critical care point of view, will always monitor with ECG. You know, SATS probe gives you a pulse rate to some extent. It won't give you a heart rate and likewise, the heart rate won't give you a pulse rate uh, in the sense that, you know, the, the, the SATS probe counts on there being delivered a parcel of blood to the finger, whereas the heart rate can be something different. You know, you can have a, in a VT, you can have a heart rate of 200, you can have a pulse rate of 80. Um, and so it's a good measure of, of being able to kind of see the difference in what's actually happening and what's being delivered in addition to using your fingers, as we just established, because SATS probe is not always a very um, reliable measure. Um, and how this is done, I, I, there's two school of thoughts. So I come from the school of thought where you, you smack two defib pads on because they stick well and they're, they're, they, they, they're, they're not going to fall off and you've got a good measure of a heart rate. Uh, and I also feel like it signals to the world that this patient is a critical care patient. I think it's important in that sense. I have personally a lot of experiences with four leads kind of popping off easily, uh, a lot more cables, a lot more fuss in the way. Um, so for me, a four lead is, is you know, it, it achieves the same, but it, it, it causes issues for me in terms of transporting and packaging the patient. So I would prefer using four lead ECGs. And I know some services as well will go down that route. Some services will not. So if, 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 you, if you happen to be a paramedic in Scotland and you want to prepare the patient for me, then please put some BFIT pads on so I can see what the heart rate's doing. Um, also, of course, blood pressure. So non-invasive blood pressure is what we're doing. There are definitely some interesting studies into using intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring pre-hospital. I know some services do it almost religiously. If you go to Norway, the air ramble is there. It's going to put uh, invasive monitoring in most patients. Uh, and it might come here. 
But until then, non-invasive blood pressure with a with a cycling blood pressure going on. You know, I'm, I'm sure I can see you're nodding, so you you probably agree with me that um, um, we want to know what's happening on a case by case basis. And this is again when we talk about our kind of I hate to use the word bandwidth, but if we use the word cognitive bandwidth, this is going to be one of the things that go up easily and early. You know, is remembering to press that blood pressure. Um, so it would be nice to just know that every time you look at the screen, you're going to have a relatively recent blood pressure because it's done it on, you know, done it on, on its own. Uh, and you know, who, who's got the answer to what's enough. My previous service, we used every three minutes. Now I think every five minutes, uh, and it is, it's a case by case basis. But if you've got the blood pressure on every five minutes, then that's a good start for us and have the SATS probe on if you can't, if you can and tidal, like you mentioned, even if that's the nasal. Sometimes you turn up to this critical care jobs and, you know, it's critical care, maybe more in the sense that the patient requires a sedation. And as part of that, you do want to monitor their breathing quite, quite closely. And then, you know, having, having just the nasal and tidal on will be beneficial and will be helpful um, as far as monitoring goes. And of course, you know, a temperature, especially before you mobilize the patient, before you put the head blocks on, you know, we only got to panic temp probes and the validity of them really in, in ascertaining a, a true temperature uh we could probably argue day in and day out but at least it'll show you what the tympanic membrane is doing at the moment uh, <laughs> and um and having that done before the head blocks go on because time and time again and i'm definitely a big perpetrator of this you kind of get in the ambulance patient's head blocked you're on your way to hospital start thinking about all the other things you can do and go has anyone done a temperature no well it's too late now you know, um, and also remembering that, you know, uh, not immediately, definitely not a, not a, uh, something you need to prioritize, I think, in the, in the trauma patients, but in medical patients, blood sugars early on, you know, anyone with a reduced level of consciousness, measure blood sugars. And, and ultimately in the trauma patient, I, I wouldn't put it into my primary or secondary survey. This is definitely something you can do on the way to hospital, unless you have a reason to think hypoglycemia was a preceding cause of trauma. And I guess that feeds back into our examination. Always be skeptical to what's happened and how it's happened, you know, um, uh, and consider that a medical incident can have caused a traumatic incident. So Stian, looking at CPR for a second. Um, so could you just sort of outline maybe some of the vital aspects of CPR that need to be quality assured to sort of optimize outcome? either that you see anecdotally on the road or that you adhere to as, as from a principal basis? Yeah, chest compressions, of course. Chest compressions, chest, chest compressions, chest compressions. So getting the, the compressions right, of course, and getting that hands off time as minimal as possible. You know, it's, you don't need me to tell you this because it already says in the evidence and it already says in the literature that what we need to do is focus on chest compressions and, and minimizing the time off the chest. But unfortunately, I still my probably biggest bugbear is the time taken off the chest to, to perform something. It's definitely much, much better than it was five years ago. Uh, we're all better at it. I'm better at it. You know, when I started practicing paramedicine as well, this wasn't, you know, we knew it was important. Um, you could, but you could take some breaks to do essential things. Um, and that is interesting how that's changed to kind of say that the only essential thing is doing chest compressions and nothing else really matters. Um, now, I'm very much talking about your patient in cardiac arrest from a cardio cardiogenic cause here. And I think it's difficult to, and I just want to, want to, want to enter that as a condition, I guess, is that do not take this for being anyone but the patient who's had a sudden medical collapse. Because in your trauma patients, in your hypoxic patients, there are going to be other things that I think takes precedence. You know, in a hypoxic or anoxic patient, you can do as many compressions as you want, but if you're not oxygenating the blood, you're getting nowhere. And you can say the same for your, your hemorrhagic patient who's, you know, they're, they're in the, probably in a low flow state and a severe shock rather than actual cardiac arrest. And then you need to look at targeting them. We can come back to that. When it comes to CPR specifically, which is for this group of collapsed medical patients, the time on the chest is what we need. And the reason for that is that we need to, to get flow to the heart. Isn't it? It's coronary blood flow. And that only occurs if we push blood into the aorta that gives blood to the coronary arteries. Uh, and as such, you know, then in a, in a, in a, in a, in a you know, cardiogenic cardiac arrest, that's what we want to achieve to optimize the chance of success when shocking. And so we're kind of on the pretense that we have a shockable rhythm as well. 
Um, of course, it goes for, for your other rhythms. You always want there to be optimal conditions in the heart. But when CPR is the treatment we give, when CPR is the most important, is when uh, the heart needs the optimal circumstance to be shocked and be ready to, to receive a shock. So hands off time. Um, deep enough is not really an issue I see anymore. But recoil, I think anyone who's done an ALS course will testify that um, that's probably a lesson they learned during that course is that they, they're not good enough at recoil. I think that goes for any of us in the heat of the moment. Um, and I think that's just, that's just how we're built. We got, you know, generally as a population, particularly a modern population, we got bigger upper bodies. If that's because you're buff or because you're beefy, um, doesn't so much matter, but that tendency to lean onto the chest, um, rather than using your hip as a, um, as a hinge, if you like. Is something I see. And so it's suddenly just kind of caving in the chest but not allowing time for recoil. And without that recoil, you're not getting that coronary filling that I just talked about. And hence, what you're trying to do is not really working for. Have you, you got any, any tidbits to share, Owen? Yeah, so great question. So yeah, so I, I see CPR or very much did see CPR um, in being performed probably too fast more so than too slowly so a metronome and the utility of a metronome was always great because actually the, the subconscious bias is that i'm doing this fine i'm doing it regular but actually nine times out of ten there's an amygdala hijack and the endogenous catecholamines are released and your homemade adrenaline takes over and it's nine times out of ten too fast uh, and that it feeds into the recoil problem because there's not enough time for recoil. So putting the metronome on consistently is, is, is absolutely key hand position as well. Um, you know, anecdotal, but your heart is roughly the size of your fist sits in the center of your chest, not off to the left, off to the right. Um, your right hands off time off chest time is, is absolutely key and, and should be minimized. And then having a debrief about CPR, because there's actually through the fundamentals of good chest compressions need to be reinforced in the debrief, almost to the point where Stian, listen, I really liked both your technique, your, your lack of time off the chest, the way you swapped with another person. I like the fact you quality assured your CPR with the metronome. I like the fact you were using closed loop communication. Um, and, and so almost bringing it out in the debrief and re-emphasizing how important some of the fundamentals are, irrespective of intubation or anything else. And so it's that positive reinforcement of practice around around the basics and then quality assuring them in the moment as well and almost sharing that with the rest of the team okay um you know make sure make sure right hands are in the center of the chest i've got the metronome on uh we're we're we're, we're going to change out i've got another rescuer another provider coming in and it, it shows the rest of the team that this is all being thought through uh in in the moment so absolutely um and everything absolutely what you what you notion towards yeah Thank you. I really like your Pavlovian approach there. Reinfor positive reinforcement is really good. Uh, essentially, just c condition the workforce uh, to do it right over and over again. But I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's important as well as actually, like you say, centering out that one bit um, uh, in the debrief rather than focusing on all the, um, if I can call it the sexy and Gucci stuff, if you want. You know, we, we, all, we all want to intubate and we all want to do these things. But actually reinforcing that because you did the basics right, that's that's what drove the team forward, which is what we're talking about, isn't it? Right. So, so Stian, could you speak to um, how important 360 access is and what that what that allows or per permits uh, for the rest of the scene? Yeah, it's uh, it's fundamental in everything I do. Um, I try to teach it as well. I, I don't I don't think it's universally taught as a kind of go to immediately. Um, I still see a lot of kind of treatment in situ in some awkward situations, um, kind of patients up against walls and, and you know, the, 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 the famous patient in the bathroom getting CPR where there's no space. Um, so, you know, why is it, why is it important? Well, first of all, for space, you know, you, optimizing your ability to help the patient, both in doing assessments properly as well as ergonomically being able to keep your muscles, your, 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 your skeleton in such a position that you can work at a prolonged time as well, you know, without exhausting yourself or causing yourself injury. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a split aspect here is, you know, your own safety. Also, of course, safety from other objects like, you know, knocking your head on that 
bathroom sink or uh, something falling down, whatever. So get yourself get yourself space for your own safety, but also for the ability to treat the patient. You know, it's going to be. Uh, we talked a little bit about it. You know, concurrent activity, uh, most likely, especially in critical care. You don't want things to just happen in isolation and slowly because then you're not really getting anywhere quickly. And and all we want to do is get somewhere quickly, slowly and smoothly, but quickly, right? Contradictory. Uh, and, and so getting that access is, is key to, to being able to have a team all around the patient, but also respond to emergencies if they should arise. So, you know, part of what we do is, of course, um, we do a lot of advanced stuff or we, we could do a lot of advanced stuff but like we mentioned earlier with the rsi and the jaw thrust just in the beginning is of course that the caveat of doing advanced stuff is that it may fail don't get me wrong basic stuff can fail as well but then usually you'll work your way up but at the advanced at, at the top if something fails you need to work your way down or even do another advanced thing you know the intubation gone wrong you now put the tube down into the right, right main bronchus and unfortunately you missed missed something, but you need to be able to access the other side of the chest so you can, can have a listen and see what's going on. Um, likewise, you just intubated the patient very successfully and three minutes later, they're in grave shock and about to have a cardiac arrest. You need to be able to reach the other side of the chest to decompress it, for example, um, or do a thoracostomy uh, as you do at kind of the advanced or critical care level. Um, and, and so you wouldn't be able to do that. Or uh, simply, uh, and anyone involved in doing RSIs will know, you know, that second access, that, that, that yeah, two IV accesses, that second access, in case one blows, you need to be able to get access to that other site of, of IV or IO access. So you can complete your anesthetic, if you like. Um, you know, the caveat here is that you put someone to sleep uh, and their airway, re airway reflexes are getting somewhat groggy. Uh, but you've been unable to paralyze them, and so you can't really intubate them. You need to have an ability to get that paralytic in as well, as, as I'm sure you know, seeing you nodding, nodding, nodding with frenzy um, over there. And so it, it's important to all that. But then it boils down to the aftermath as well for your momentum, you know, packaging the patient. With that 360 axis, you can have, the, you can have a split scoop either side. You can be ready to go, and you can have that forward momentum as well to kind of crack on and get going to where the patient ultimately needs to be, no matter how awesome we are doing what we do, they need to go to hospital. So Stian, you've mentioned um, around keeping the patient warm and the, the, the importance and fundamental importance really about uh, avoiding hypothermia. So maybe if we could just progress onto something that is probably key to your practice and that everyone can embody, which is around sort of non-technical skills really. And so just in your mind, how can clinicians or otherwise sort of opti optimize communication in times of stress look at sort of looking at the non-technical uh, aspect of you know communication being the the first modality you use as you step through the door how can how can patients optimize their communication yeah how can we do that you know that's the that's the holy grail isn't it really owen um communication is the root of all good and the root of all evil if you do it really well it's going to make everything so so simple and so nice and fall into place uh, and if you if you don't do well um it's it's going to be what trips you up in the end one way or the other um that's not to say that if you had an incident you should beat yourself up because you're not an excellent communicator you might well be but it relies on everyone doesn't it just like you say on, on you know what about the provider what about the patient you might be excellent at communicating and, and part of that goes to compensating for other people's downfall in communicating but ultimately if your patient is unconscious and not communicating that is going to put a trap for you. That is going to make things more difficult and hard, harder for you later on. Whereas if you've got a fully communicating, complacent patient who tells you everything and answers all your questions, the job's a simple one. Um, and, and so, you know, having that ability to establish a rapport with your patient is, is ultimately responsible. And I, you know, the, the people that I really look up to I've made an art out of this and, and, you know, no matter how good they are at doing a thoracostomy or, or doing an RSI or, that doesn't really so much matter how many thoracostomies or thoracotomies you've done in your life. The people I look up to are the people who, who are good at this, who are good communicators and can show up and almost just intuitively knows not just what to say, but how to say it and who to say it to, you know, um, and all these things are really important. And, and it kind of takes communication, expands it into this concept of team resource management um, and being able to, to decide what's going to happen when and for who and with who. Um, 
but 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 going back to your question then how can we optimize communication well so we, we mentioned a couple of things that we've done already to just offload our own cognitive bandwidth which which feeds into this which is you know putting monitoring on and letting it trickle on on itself doing the basics right and doing them early put something under the head you don't have to consider that later on and then when you are communicating the rsi for example the basics have been done so you can focus on the more advanced and and getting everyone there and that's usually i think when just from experience again is when things go wrong is when you go through your rsi checklist which is a nice communication tool and then you identify something that's been missed and that's when that's when you have one of these really kind of sensitive weak points in communication where things can start going wrong someone starts to correct it the other person continues with the checklist which is maybe not the right thing to do and other things get missed in the in 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 the battle because there's so much concurrent activity so where i said earlier 360 degrees access for concurrent activity you also need to manage that and how do we do that well you know anecdotally for at least for the last few years that whole pit stop um, uh, approach, I guess, to, to cardiac arrest, at least, which is how it's been. We also try and achieve in the critical care patient, being medical or trauma, to get someone to take a step back and have an overview and have that ultimate awareness. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's all about communication is built up by situational awareness. If you know what's going on and you are communicating it, your communication will be better as well because... Uh, you're encouraging other people to communicate back to you. And it's all about this, you know, we, we may be looking at the same thing, but we might perceive it differently. And our situational awareness is, of course, the sum of what you see and what I see, isn't it? So you might see, going back to our patient the other day, who had kind of low blood pressure, good blood pressure, but poor pulse. You know, one person might see the blood pressure is good. They have a pulse. And the other person might say, well, the quality of that pulse is questionable and they've been in an ITU bed for five days, there's no fluids hanging. You know, I, I've noticed that the fluids aren't hanging. Did you see that? And that put together could have saved us earlier on in that situation by knowing and communicating what we were seeing at the time. Um, but you won't know that. You won't know that unless people are talking to you about what they see and what they do. Kind of gone a little bit on the tangent here and brought this more probably into, into uh, situational awareness, but talking about the non-technical skills you know, situational awareness is what we want to achieve by our communication. Um, that being gathering the information from the patient or telling that information to someone else um, it is all about feeding into that joint picture, operational picture, I guess, of what, what is going on and what needs to be done uh, and what are we expecting to, to happen as a result of that? You know, what do we want to achieve? Sorry, please, please, please feel free to, uh, to, to, to chip in with some of your own thoughts. No, that's everything you said there is is absolutely fantastic, Stian. And like you said, a lot of you know everyone can embody these these techniques. You know, a new notion towards sharing a mental model, and that really just no, means actually oversharing what your thoughts. And everyone can do so to actually you know what are you seeing? What's even if we're on scene, you know, Stian, what are you thinking? Um, and I'll tell you what I'm thinking and we'll try and articulate from the whole team if we're missing anything. And, and so it is that culture of almost oversharing to make sure that every, everyone's been heard um, and, and, and you're coming to the best, the best conclusion. Also, this closed loop communication, this read receipt and with incremental stress, background noise, which becomes foreground noise. Um, and especially if the patient's making noise because they've got an agitated head injury, then you can't get feedback from them. The, your communication needs to become so much more pronounced and overt and having that read receipt from people is absolutely key. To, uh, and that quite often involves nonverbal communication with eye contact, um, the reiteration of the message back to you to make sure it's the correct message. Um, and then ta on task completion, them coming back to, to you to, for either for them for another task or to share the mental model again. So, but it, interestingly, especially when I've worked in London and other services, m the more resources on scene actually create this problem more frequently because the more, the more bodies you have, 
the more malaise occurs and actually the more pronounced you need to be with your with your communication it's almost easier with less resources on scene where there's not as 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 much there's not these micro conversations because a macro conversation needs to happen people need to have this macro conversation so everyone is aware of like you said before the defined outcomes in 5 10 15 minutes and then we'll break them down into the details but that we need you need to dispel micro conversations and have a macro conversation and then and, and then and then put synergize and put the team to work and, and 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 in my mind that flow of communication whilst illustrating your equally as able to become task focused and unidimensional means that you can then say, guys, am I missing anything? Am I missing anything? Is there anything else here we, that I am not seeing? I've shared exactly what's on my mind. Um, and in incremental stressful situations, this seems to, seems to work uh, optimally for me because you, you, you very much need to be intentional with your communication. Yeah. I, and I think you're, you're, you're definitely saying something that's resonating with me and, and probably many others as well that are in these situations where, where you are, um, I, I guess, at the spearhead of a team sometimes where, where people are looking to you. Uh, and I really like what you say about, you know, this, this speaking up, um, again, re just reiterating that, especially for, for the student paramedics who might be listening here, is, um, but, but everyone else as well, is that even if you don't necessarily know exactly what's needed or what's going on if you just verbalize it someone else probably will and will pick up on it if you mention it and it's almost like uh, if your team leader is is, is the, the the chef and knows the recipe and knows what you want to make i guess cook is probably a more english word um is the cook and knowing the recipe and knows you know the ultimate goal which is going to be this is what we need to piece together to get going uh then then there's no harming you putting the ingredients on the on on the table next to them offering that that ingredient is up to the chef whether or not they need to use that ingredient whether or not the information is necessary you know throwing out a lot of unnecessary facts is not important but if, if you observe something say it and then other people can can use that information either to uh, i guess strengthen their opinion and picture what's happening or or lessen it um as, uh, yeah i just want to, uh, that resonated quite well with me <laughs> Stan, you mentioned around situation awareness. We've mentioned closed loop communication, shared mental models. Um, could you maybe speak to, as we before we just move on, around active listening and the, the power of active listening and how indeed we do active listen? Yeah, I, th I think I just said about, you know, taking in those pieces of information. And you also mentioned a lot of this, Owen, I think, wasn't it? Getting that eye contact when you're talking to people, you know, you're, you're even if you're speaking to people, you are also listening. Uh, and when you mentioned that, it made me think of plenty of times where I've asked someone to do something for me. You know, could you put a pelvic binder on or could you get a Kendrick's traction device on? And you could easily do that and look away and then you miss these subtle nuances of, you know, you might hear okay, but if you just look at this person, you can see the, the, the despair in their eyes as they realize they've never used a Kendra traction device. Um, and if you're not actively listening, so engaging, you know, it's not just looking at people for the, you know, the traditionally how we learn about nonverbal, verbal communication, you know, showing respect is, of course, an important bit of it. But it's also because it tells you something. It tells you whether or not the person you just tasked is up for that task or maybe do that, but bring this guy with you to help you, you know, or maybe you too can do that, or maybe you would get some IV access instead and we'll get someone else to do the KTD. Um, uh, so it's really important to just, you know, like I say, uh, eyes on, uh, look at the person you're communicating with. Uh, and likewise, it, it can tell you if someone is providing you information, it can give you that information of whether or not they have high confidence or low confidence in what they're telling you. You know, you pick up on these subtle clues. Are they you know, are they confident about what they're telling you? Have they actually checked? And we all have kind of been, I think, in that situation where we supervise a student, for example, and they turn around, they listen to a chest and they turn around and kind of say, it's, it's clear. And you can just see that they have no idea whether that chest is clear or not. Um, and so it's, 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 I guess it's, it's important to whether or not you're going to take things at face value. Uh, and if you look in a way and you, you're just perceiving information left, right, and center, you might be getting false pieces of information or at least not necessarily intended to be false, but an inconfident piece of information. And that definitely feeds into your overall impression, not just of what was actually happening with the patient or the result of your intervention, but also tells you who you're working with. 
and can be quite important, you know, especially in the early stages when you just arrived on scene, you're trying to get a feel for people and how they will fit into the wider team, which is, you know, part of this team resource management is how am I going to use you? If you can identify someone who's really kind of switched on, uh, they can be a really key player. You can also notice things among the team when they communicate who has the natural leadership in that group. And often it might be important not to step in and declare yourself as the critical care paramedic and I'm here to take over. Very rarely that's, that bears success. If the team is maxed out, it might be required. But more often than not, is finding who's the natural leader and supporting them. Uh, and in one way, turning yourself into a follower, I guess, um, a, a helpful follower that that suggests ways to go about things, but let them keep that leadership. And you'll only pick up on that if you if you take a second to stop and, I guess, in the wider sense of listening with your eyes and your ears and your senses. Um, otherwise, you won't get there. Dan, could you speak to some of the the, the incremental gains that that can be made and small wins uh, that that paramedics and or otherwise could could make on scene that could contribute to contribute to some of the bigger wins within critical care yeah yeah i think we, we talked a lot about small incremental gains already so you know you got your get your monitoring on early um uh, and you know really sum it up i guess or bake it into the the acronym coma which i'm sure many people know particularly if you worked in london i'm sure you're quite quite well versed in coma which you know is an acronym for clothes oxygen monitoring and access uh, and it touches on quite a few of the things that we've already mentioned so i said like make sure your patient is exposed so you can see what's going on so get the clothes off so you can see what's going on i do want to add here you know consider hypo, uh, hypothermia and how you cover your patient up again but you can exchange clothes for blankets uh, to some degree you know just because you want to see what's going on doesn't mean you don't cover your patient up so uh let's instead of just saying clothes let's say clothes for blankets O for oxygen, which we already kind of highlighted, is often forgotten. So if you just get it on right and early, it's another cognitive offload when we arrive. It's another basic thing that a critical care team doesn't have to add. And I say we, that's a royal we, of course, you know. Um, uh, it's another thing that we, we don't have to worry about. And not only just having oxygen on the patient, but having making sure you have enough oxygen available to where you are. You know, especially if this patient is a critical care patient, you might have already clocked that the reason I am getting back up from a critical care team here is to do an RSI because the patient is combative. Then if you think that's going to happen, have an extra oxygen bottle available ready nearby because that's going to be required. Uh, monitoring. Um, so we, we talked about this already, you know, get the right monitoring on. We want to know what the heart rate is, what the entitle is doing, make sure the blood pressure is cycling. And this, you know, bear local procedures in mind. I know some services where the critical care team will have a different type of monitor or their monitor might have different functions. And so then the marginal gain there will be in maybe not over monitoring the patient so that when the critical care team comes, there's less cables and stuff to muck about with because they might have to swap onto different monitoring. Whatever is appropriate to your service, but be mindful of, first of all, getting all the information through monitoring, but also priming the patient so they're ready for when the critical care team arrives, potentially, or arguably for your handover. So it could also be just aligning monitoring and keeping the cables nice and tidy. So when you do get to hospital, it's an easy swap over. Um, I think in my experience, the monitoring and keeping cables tidy is, is an art in itself. Uh, and I'm not really good at it myself, to be honest with you. I'd really love to be. Um, but, uh, it just takes amazing organizational skills to do it. And access. And, you know, access times two is the old adage. And I think we can stick with that. You know, one good access is better than two bad ones. I'll always stand by that. Um, uh, so to make sure you have one good, really great access. And if that's all you can achieve, then that is good enough. But can, if you can get another one in, you have just increased that safety margin for yourself if the other one blows, or again, if this patient needs an RSI or something else, or if they need concurrent blood, calcium, and so on and so on. Um, so coma, I think, is, is the first kind of marginal gains. Easy to remember. If you've done that, a lot is done. I think the second, um, which is arguably probably higher priority than coma, is, is exit strategy. I probably should have mentioned that first. You know, turn up on scene, first thing I ask myself is how, how can I get out of here? Because if there's a safety issue to myself, I want to know where safety is. But ultimately, like I said earlier, no matter how much cool stuff we can do pre-hospital these days, and the amount of 
exciting and advanced interventions we can bring to a patient to really start that chain of survival or, or chain of recovery, if you like, early, they do need to get to hospital. Uh, and that also feeds back into the decision to, should we do advanced cool stuff here inside the house on the second floor, or is it better to wait until we're outside in the ambulance? Uh, and I find that's the thing that might sometimes throw people is that they've called the critical care team for help. The patient's an obvious RSI. Crew is still on the second floor landing with the patient. And we turn up and go, we do not want to tube this patient here. Uh, it's not the right place for this to happen. Get them down. And you kind of get this almost... And it's important, again, feeding back into communication to do this more tactfully than I just did, um, because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to ruin people's, I guess, um, expectation to what you're doing. Like, the, you know, reinforce that you've done the right call. This patient's going to need an RSI. We completely agree, but it's more, much more safer for that to happen downstairs, for example. Um, and so, but if that extrication has happened before we arrive, if the patient is at a point where you think they're going to need critical care, but it can happen in a better environment, going back to our 360 degrees access, then remove that patient to an area where you have that 360 degrees access. Another marginal gain, but that's, that's, that's one of those things that just easily eats five minutes when the critical care team comes, because you then need to scoop the patient and need to move the patient. If that's done before we arrive, then, then life is much easier and better. Designate the, the ambulance that's going to take the patient. If you, you already allocated who's going to drive the ambulance, these are things we routinely do but if we didn't have to do it then they would be there for us you know when we get in the ambulance who's going to drive well then just get in the driver's seat you know get ready be primed onwards movement ah, going on about just rambling on there <laughs> no it's good stian that's good that's good so listen as we come in to land on the conversation stian just a couple of last last questions really one would be could you maybe speak to kit husbandry and how important sort of kit husbandry is uh, around maybe kit dumps or having tactical kit around the, around the patient and then and then back in and then just anything else that you can think of really just that might be helpful as we as we bring the conversation to a close. Uh, yeah, so quick kit husbandry equipment governance, what you want to call it, I guess. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's increasingly important, and it's something I I guess personally didn't really uh, wouldn't say didn't care about, but maybe didn't kind of afford the importance that it really does hold for a slick and optimal scene. And this just goes back to kind of uh, cognitive bandwidth, uh, <laughs> in lack of a better word. Um, going back to to reinforcing that, you know, if if you if you have a system first and foremost, so. Make sure that you, anyone, whoever you are, with the kit that you normally use, make sure you're familiar with it and make sure that you have a system to how you place it and how you use it. And that might look different from organization to organization, service to service, team to team. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into the details of that. But, um, but knowing what you have, where you have it, and where you like to have it is really important. And I think most people will find that that's probably going to be somewhere on the right side of the airway because that's where you'd like your assistant to be if you were going to intubate or doing an eye gel or or whatnot and then that feeds back into where would you then like your monitor because if you go to your critical care patient we're not talking about doris who sat on the sofa with a little bit of chest pain here we're talking about the patient who's critically unwell probably lying on the floor or some other some other surface and you have to do things then you probably find yourself at the head end or you have someone doing an airway even if it's just monitoring or leading the scene from the head end, right? Uh, and then the monitor needs to be available for that person, um, particularly if that person is the person leading the scene, going back to feeding information into the, into the one channel, you know, the, 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 the cook uh, that, that ultimately knows the recipe needs to know if they got enough eggs, if you'd like. Sorry, it's a poor analogy. But, <laughs> but they need to know the information they need to know, which, which is also on the monitor. Um, and um, um, you want you want you you know your most critical items accessible to you immediately. So you you know your airways uh, and potentially your IV access and fluids, the stuff that you can use to do something with, um, or it might be a thoracostomy set if you got access to that. Something that you can easily kind of alleviate immediate threats to, to life with. And then you need the system for where your auxiliary bits are going to be. What what about the other things that you may need? You know the the um, um, pediatric extension tube, maybe that you might not need in 
more than 1% of your RSIs. But when you need it, you need to know where it is and you need to have it handy. Uh, a bandage, you know, we, e- good to have easily available, but how, how often do we really go to people who are exsanguinating outwards? Um, and again, that's what I'm saying, role in organization specific. If you're a soldier, you're probably going to need access to blast bandages more than you're going to need access to an RSI kit. Uh, if you work in civilian critical care in the UK, uh, an RSI kit and thoracostomy is going to be what you're going to be doing most of the time as an advanced skill or maybe having access to blood. Um, and it's all about putting that, you know, in a system where it's easily accessible and reachable, but also not in the way of that 360 access. And you need to honor that 360 access. Uh, and sometimes a system of that can just be to decentralize the kit dump and do a kit dump somewhere else, bring the patient to the kit dump if the patient is well enough for that. Um, uh, uh, which is absolutely appropriate. Sometimes it might even involve working across the patient. And then what 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 will you do? So if you go to the thoracotomy, you know the dreaded thoracotomy, you actually got an operator doing this on either side of the chest, with operator number one typically being the one who goes hand into the chest, and operator number two assisting. But you know, optimally, where do we put the equipment? How, where do we use it for that team to be? Uh, working as a two you need one who takes responsibility for the kit which is going to be your assistant you and me i guess in many circumstances you and i even if i'm going to be grammatically correct but um you you um, you need that kit to be available to both in case one gets tied in doing something else or stuck in doing something else and it's that planning for the what if i guess as well which we haven't touched a lot on and maybe can come back to but plan for that what if and the same goes for the surgical airway if both are going to be sat either side of the chest you need to really operate from the center of the chest and so you need to think about how am i going to get my kit there um when am i going to do it you know is this a planned thing is it a is it a semi-planned so a surgical airway typically would be a i guess a semi-planned incident you don't want it to happen you're not planning for it to happen but you have a plan in case it does need to happen and then w- when when is that decision to bring the kit out to both trigger you cognitively but also be available for you when you really need it um and so personally for me uh when we do these morning briefs we as we do do at least where i work we always talk about these kind of what do we do how would you and, and we're trying to change this into rather being talking about an SOP that should be a standard thing. We more talk about what's your expectations, because that feeds into everything we do is the expectation, isn't it? What's your expectation of what's going to happen? And I've never done a surgical airway in, 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 in a live patient, put my hands up to that. But my expectation to that happening would be um, I wouldn't be on the airway. That would be a doctor or consultant at that time, because if I have failed my intubation attempts, my natural thing would be to hand that over to the doctor. Um, And so they're at the head end. And then I have access to the kit, which is great. So my expectation would be if if the doctor or the consultant I'm working with now has gone to an eye gel, that is my cue for bringing out a surgical airway kit, placing it on the patient's chest, both as a reminder that we do have this option if anything else fails, but it's also there immediately if we require it. And then if it goes to the point where we're both in agreement that this is going to now turn into a surgical airway, the doctor will then you know, pull the patient up, extend the neck, and I will bring out the kit as according to SOP. And that's, that's really when the SOP starts. We don't have an SOP for what do you do leading up to it. And those are the kind of things, I guess, as well, when it comes to kit husbandry, you need to practice in your mind, mentally model, what, how would I use my kit? Where would I have it? What would I use with, do with it? And also then, you know, going back to communication, communicate that to your team. If you're a paramedic working with 10 different ECAs every, every month, um, or if you're with a permanent crewmate, make sure you have these chats, even if it's just a quick in the morning. By the way, this is probably not going to happen, but if it does, this is what I expect you to do. Again, a point I labor a lot, Owen, I'm really sorry, but... <laughs> It, it's, it's always prudent to, uh, and to hope for the best, but expect the worst, or at least anticipate the worst. Absolutely, and I think that's once you've shared that worst case scenario, then then everything else is is is, is better from there. Because um, because yeah, it will if it does get to that point, then at least you're briefed for it. So um, listen, Stian, I'm mindful we've been going for just over an hour, and it's we've covered some real ground actually. Oh, sorry. 
that's no it's good it's good but listen my thanks to you Stian. and um just as we just as we close on the conversation if people want to reach out out to you for further sort of questions or indeed comments um are you on twitter facebook instagram is there any any socials that you're that you're on uh, I'm on I'm on the gram, not really as a professional entity, but I'm always happy to discuss critical care, basics of, of care, anything really related to it. You know, I'm quite passionate about what we do and doing it right. Uh, hence why I'm guessing I'm in the position where I'm taking on way too much teaching in university and practicing with patients. Um, so on Instagram, it's uh, S-T-I-A-N-M-O-H, Stian Moh. Um, which I'm sure you can link to if you need to um, or I'm on ResearchGate if anyone is into their research um, not that I have a lot published yet but I'm also approachable there if anyone wants to re- reach out so so that's where I would be available Fantastic I just leaves me to say thanks Diana. I really appreciated both your perspectives and your insights over the past hour so thank you mate